Okay, so this video is intended just as an initial introduction to the properties and the structure of metals only. Um, we're going to be moving from a simple understanding of the particle model to one that gives us some internal structure to atoms using the, the Thomson plum pudding model. And we'll use this to develop a model of metallic structure good enough to explain the, the common properties of metals. You'll need to have come across the idea that like charges repel and that opposite charges attract. So let's start with talking about some of the properties metals have in common with each other. So firstly, they, they conduct heat and electricity, and this makes them good for wiring to, to carry an electric current and for, for saucepans to allow energy to pass efficiently from your hob to your food through heating. In a pure form, they, they tend to be shiny or lustrous, and they, they tend to have um, high melting and boiling points, all except one, mercury, um, don't have enough thermal energy to exist as a liquid at room temperature. Um, fourthly, they, they can be bent or hammered into shape. We say that they're malleable and they can also be drawn out into wires um, and we have a different word for this, uh, ductile or ductility. Uh, they're insoluble. Um, if you put an iron nail in water, it doesn't dissolve. Uh, and that's a good thing, of course, if you're, if you're into making bridges, because they wouldn't work as well if they washed away the first time it rained. So remember, some metals, of course, can react with water and form compounds that may dissolve, but the metal itself does not dissolve. So one of the first insights that we had that the atom had some internal structure was from an experiment done by J.J. Thompson in 1897. And he was working with a piece of uh, um, equipment that allowed him to heat up a piece of metal that was in a glass piece of apparatus under low pressure. So there was, there was very little air in there to interfere with the experiment. A little bit like an old-fashioned light bulb. He noticed that if a very high voltage electric field was placed nearby, something could be stripped off the hot metal and, and accelerated towards the other end of this piece of equipment. Um, importantly, it didn't matter what metal was used. This substance could be stripped off any of them, so it seemed reasonable to suggest that it might be present in all atoms, this substance. Uh, this beam of particles was invisible, um, but a special phosphorescent coating glowed where the beam hit it, and that allowed him to see the path that the beam was following. By experimenting with magnets and electric fields, he was able to determine that the things in this beam had a negative charge by the way that the beam was bent around or deflected. Uh, any moving charge will interact with a magnetic or an electric field, and that's of course how electromagnets work. So how much the beam was deflected was going to be related to the charge of the particles within it and their mass. We can think of this by imagining a number of vehicles crossing a windy bridge. Okay, so we've got an empty van and a fully laden van, and they're driving over with a small car that's full of people. And we'll assume that the small car has the same mass as the empty van when it's full. Okay, so the main thing that's going to be different, really, is uh, their size between, between the car and the empty van. As these vehicles are driving over the bridge, okay, if both of the drivers took their hands off the wheel, which one, okay, the, the, the small car or, or the van, would be blown off course the most if they happen to have the same mass? Okay, the, and the, the van's going to have a big side that the wind can catch. It's going to be deflected the most. In this case, the surface area catching the wind is a bit like the, part, the charge of the particle interacting with the electric field as we apply it. Okay, so if the two vans were to drive over the bridge at the same time, which would be deflected the most? Okay, so both of them are going to have the same surface area presented to the wind. In this case, the, the lightest van is going to be deflected the most. And this makes sense, because if you, if you pulled over on the motorway and there was a broken down car and a broken down lorry looking for a push, you probably help the car knowing that there's no way you're going to be able to push that heavier lorry. It, it takes more um, force for you to accelerate that lorry by, by the same amount as, as it would for you to do that for the car. So what was amazing in Thompson's experiment was that his particles were deflected a lot by relatively small magnetic and electric fields. 
And the question was, was he looking at an empty truck or a full car? The, the mass and the charge both affected Thomson's experiments. It was unclear whether his particles, which later came to be called electrons, were they incredibly light with a fairly unusual charge, or perhaps they had an enormous charge but with an unremarkable mass. This question was finally put to rest in 1909 when Robert Millikan at the University of Chicago measured charged droplets of oil falling between two electric plates. The plates were set up in such a way that the droplets would be attracted to the higher one, opposing the force of gravity. By comparing the speed at which they fell with the electric plates turned on and turned off, he was able to measure the charge on the droplets, you know, how much they were attracted to the, the upper plate. Now let's look at an imaginary set of results for the charge on these droplets. Maybe we have um, something like the, the table that we see here. What do you notice? All of these numbers are multiples of 2, and there aren't any smaller numbers than 2. This must mean that the droplets are gaining and losing charge in lump pieces, and those lump pieces must be the electrons. Now Millikan's numbers, of course, were, were a little bit more complicated than these, and the numbers were, were much, much smaller, but from this he was able to work out the charge on the electron. And because we already knew their mass-to-charge ratio from Thomson's beam-bending experiment, we were now able to find that the mass of these particles was way smaller, about 1,800 times smaller than the lightest atom. The atom itself must have some internal structure. So we now knew that these particles, okay, are about 1,800 times lighter than an atom, and they have a negative charge and we know that the atom is neutral. So Thomson came up with a model where there was positive charge evenly distributed throughout the rest of the atom, but with these small particles stuck into it, kind of like blueberries in a muffin. Okay, it came to be known as the plum pudding model after a dessert with bits of fruit stuck in it. Now let's try using this model to account for some of the properties of metals. Let's imagine that the atoms that make up a piece of solid metal and think about how they're going to be arranged. Okay, so the particles, they're fixed in position in a regular repeating lattice. Don't forget, of course, that even if you're drawing a diagram um, and it's unable to show this, they are, of course, likely to be vibrating, you know, jiggling around in position. And what's the best way of arranging them? Well, you might draw something like this and we call this cubic close packing because you can imagine that if you start placing arrangements of particles with lots of squares in the, the shape of the structure like this, and then build up multiple layers, then you could imagine that the structure is made up of lots of cube units, each consisting of eight particles stuck together. You might also draw something like this, and we call this hexagonal close packing. Either one of those is fine, but have a think about which you think might be a better representation. The atoms are likely to arrange themselves to be as close as possible to each other because of the attractive force or, or holding power that they feel for one another. In this case, the latter structure seems better as there are fewer, smaller gaps between the particles. Either is an acceptable representation though, and you might see me draw the former from time to time as it's less cluttered. Don't forget that this is just a slice through a 3D structure though. There will be layers above and below these, and of course the structure continues in every direction for billions upon billions of atoms. What is this holding power, though? Well, we know that metals conduct electricity, and we know that electricity is just charged particles moving from one place to another. And we know that these particles have negative charge, so it seems likely that these particles might be the electrons Thomson discovered. Let's plum puddingize this particle model. Once we have our basic structure, then we can add the electrons and some way of remembering that the rest of the atom has an overall positive charge. The more electrons we have, the higher the positive charge on the rest of the atom must be in order to balance the charge that they have. 
in order for the material to be able to conduct electricity, at least some of these particles must be able to move through this lattice, this regular arrangement of particles. Now let's imagine a simple metal with three electrons. The rest of the atom must have what charge? Okay, well it's going to be three plus as there are three electrons, each one of those having one negative charge. We'll imagine that one of the electrons on each atom is able to move and carry an electric current. If we imagine that at one instance it's not attached to any particular atom, we can say that rather than being localized and fixed to a particular atom, that, that it has become delocalized. The atom was initially neutral overall, 3 plus charge for the positive, and 3 negative electrons balancing that charge out, if one of those has been removed, what's left must be charged. Will it be positive or negative? So you've got to be careful here. Some students might say, well, you're taking something away from it, so it must be negative because you've taken something away from it and it started off as zero, right? But if you look at the charges, though, this doesn't make sense. We now have two electrons left behind, each with a negative charge, but the rest of the atom originally had a 3 plus charge. That 3 plus charge is still there. We now only have two negative charges to balance it from the two electrons, and that leaves us with a plus 1 charge overall. We're taking a negative away, which is making our particle become more positive. At this point, the electron is between two of these positive atom-like particles. By definition, an atom must be neutral, so we use another word, ion, to describe these particles. If the electron for a moment is here, what forces will it experience? It's going to be attracted to any positive charge. So which positive charge will it be attracted to? Some students might suggest that it's attracted to the ion it just left, but funny enough, uh, electrons don't have a memory. Okay, it has a negative charge, so it's going to be attracted to any positive charge. That means it's going to be attracted to all of its nearest neighbor ions equally. It will, in theory, even attract very slightly to ions further away. This electrostatic attractive force between the delocalized electrons and the metal ions is the nature of the metallic bond. When we say electrostatic, we mean an interaction between two charged objects. So when you rub your hair with a balloon and it sticks to the wall, that's an example of an electrostatic force. So are there any particles repelling one another here? Well, yes, of course, because there are these metal ions which all have a positive charge, and they must be repelling one another. The electrons themselves will also be repelling one another. We don't often see metal spontaneously exploding, so the overall attractive force between the delocalized electrons and the metal ions must outweigh the repulsive forces between the metal ions themselves and between the delocalized electrons. Overall, there is this strong attractive force. Okay, so let's go over this one more time, um, a little bit simpler uh, to... There we go. Um, a little bit simpler, um, so we've got some room to talk about what's going on uh, just one more time. So I'm only going to draw uh, four particles. Ideally, these would be touching. Um, and these are going to be our atoms. We, we haven't yet sort of delocalized any electrons. And just to remind ourselves, of course, that each one of these atoms, okay, overall is neutral. Okay, because it's got three negative electrons. Okay, and it's got three, a three plus positive charge on the rest of the atom. Okay, so it's neutral. Now, the issue that we have is that Thomson's model doesn't allow us to predict how many electrons we actually have for a metal. So we need to sort of make this a little bit more general so that we can actually use it. But whatever we do, we need to make sure that uh, we understand uh, and use a, a consistent approach. So let's, let's imagine saying, well, okay, I have some neutral metal atoms. 
Okay, and I'm not going to show all of the electrons because I don't exactly know how many electrons there are, but I can represent the fact that I might have uh, some delocalized. So I've got six. So I'm, I'm going to maybe let's imagine that each metal atom uh, is able to deloc has one delocalized electron flowing through the lattice potentially, or, or between the metal uh, particles. So we've got one, two, three, four, five, six. Okay, and now all I need to do is say, well, the what remains behind, okay, it will have electrons in there as well. It hasn't delocalized all of them, but what remains behind will have an overall positive charge. It's no longer an atom, it's an ion. Okay, okay so we, we've got this sort of basic Thompson model now. We don't necessarily know how many electrons the atom has in total, but we can qualitatively predict you know, how many uh, electrons each atom is delocalizing. And you know, in this case, we're delocalizing one atom, sorry, one electron per atom. So what remains behind must have an overall positive charge. And we want to link this model now to the structure, uh, sorry, to the properties of our metals again. And the, the first thing on our list that we have is that metals conduct heat and electricity. And we can explain that in the sense that uh, the, the electrons are able to carry um, the thermal energy through the lattice and uh, allow to the charge to move. Okay, so um, we can say that the current is carried by delocalized electrons. Um, can we explain why metals are shiny using this model? Not really. Okay, uh, so I mean, this is a limitation of this model. Um, can we explain why they have high melting and boiling points? Okay, so we, we can maybe say that we've got many strong electrostatic forces uh, between the delocalized electrons and the metal ions left behind. Can we explain why they're insoluble? Mm, not, we don't yet have enough in, you know, information uh, specifically using this model unless we know something about water uh, as well. Uh, if you know a fair amount about the way that sort of water interacts with other substances, then perhaps, but um, we're probably not going to be at that level. But we can also explain why they're malleable, because if you imagine you've got two sort of layers of, of metal ions, okay. Now, if we were to apply a force to one part of this metal structure, you know, let's imagine we start hitting um, along here really hard, what can happen is perhaps we can nudge all of those uh, atoms along one position. Okay, and we can still see that actually we can still form good strong bonds. You know, the, the ions don't necessarily know exactly what position they're in, even if they, if they move along one position, they can still form bonds to the neighboring ions. And so, you know, th this is a substance that could bend and still have a, a decent structure. You might be looking at sort of the edge here and say, well, what's going to happen to this guy? Of course, remember that this is part of uh, billions and billions of uh, metal ions and electrons going in, in each direction. So, um, you know, it, it's, you, you can remember this, this structure is going to sort of continue going on uh, for a significant way. And we're going to have a position that we'll be able to move this layer along um, and still form uh, the set bonds of the same strength uh, as what we had before. So we've got this idea that, you know, th this could be something that is bendy, it isn't going to be malleable as, a, as opposed to just snapping um, straight away if we break it. I wonder, you know, the last thing we might want to think about is can we use this model to try and sort of compare the differences between uh, different metals? And one thing I'm going to ask you to sort of think about uh, as I leave this video is how could you draw um, particle diagrams to try and explain why we might have one metal that appears to have a higher melting point than another metal? Okay, and I'm going to give you a clue. I'm going to say, let's, let's imagine that uh, this higher melting point metal uh, also conducts uh, electricity uh, a little bit better than the, the first metal. So there's a number of things that you could think about. How could we explain why one metal might have uh, a higher melting point than another metal? How could we explain how one metal might conduct electricity?
better than another metal. Okay, a few things to think about and we'll talk about that another time.